Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. You have tuned in to the Python Pulse live stream, which is every second Friday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific. I am your host, Dawn Wages. I am the Python Community Product Manager here at Microsoft. And I am, I, I say this every episode, I, I, I really mean it, especially today. I am thrilled to bring you another episode this month with one of my favorite people, my friend and colleague. So I, I see I see a bunch of you uh, joining. This is so exciting. As you are joining, uh, joining the stream, we keep this interactive. Post where you're tuning in from. Um, uh, oh, also, I'm really, really excited. Uh, post where uh, you heard about the stream. I'm curious. Did you hear about it on Twitter, on Mastodon, on Discord, somewhere else? Did you just happen to, to stroll by? I'm really excited you're here, regardless of where you're coming from. If it's your first time, welcome. If it's your second time, welcome, welcome. Um, this week, we'll be jumping into deploying a Python application in VS Code with our resident expert, Python in VS Code PM, Luciana Bug. I'll pass over to my friend and colleague to introduce herself more um, about what we'll be digging in today. But we plan to cover some great how-tos on deploying your first application to Azure through VS Code. Also, just like setting up your applications. We're going to click around. We have a live demo. It's going to be really great. Um, and like, you know, opportunity for things to go wrong, which I love, but it's going to go great. I know it will. Um, but first, we're going to do some announcements. I have, we're, we're chock full of announcements. It's really, it's really that time of year. Uh, so we have a uh, Pi Day that's coming on uh, May 2nd, 2023. So I said uh, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. And it's a full day live stream with Pamela Fox. We had a great episode with Pamela Fox, our first episode actually of Python Pulse with Pamela Fox. It another great stream. Um, and so we have great content that's included, but not limited to building and testing and deploying uh, fast API, Django, cloud databases, containerizing your application with Docker, all on May 2nd. So join that. It's a full day. It's going to be great. Uh, this is also a pre-PyCon episode, so you'll get a sneak peek of what many uh, of our presentations we're going to be doing at the booth. Microsoft is returning as a sustaining sponsor, um, and so we're going to have like a lot of stuff. So uh, we have a lab plan for you, uh, deploying uh, Azure Container Apps. And then I did another, we've just been busy. I did another live stream with uh, Jay Miller yesterday about uh, deploying Azure Container Apps. It might help you to uh, complete the challenge and then you have the potential to win a lot of fun, cool prizes. So that's great. And if you're not going to be in Salt Lake City with us, uh, you have the opportunity to, I think you can still buy tickets on um, for PyCon virtually. Um, and if not, you can also join us at our Discord, which is aka.ms forward slash Python hyphen Discord. Um, so really, really excited. And just join us anyway. We're in there all the time. We answer Python questions. We're all super friendly. Luciana's there. Jay's there. Pamela's there. Sarah's there. We got a whole crew of really, really cool people in that Discord. So join us. Become our friends. We talk about Pi and Python and snakes and things. Uh, I just mentioned Azure Container App. So great segue. There was a release recently. There's the uh, April 2023 release. And they had um, a new, they're announcing a new plan and pricing structure designed to adapt compute options into indiv individual apps and microservices. So there's more details on that. All of this is located in the uh, in the stream and the stream notes below. Um, and you can uh, it, it really it's kind of one of the uh, the the ability to containerize your Python application and deploy it to the cloud is really a, the bread and butter of how uh, Pythonistas typically have gotten their uh, code up into the cloud. We have app service, we have a lot of other plans and it's more and more proliferating in the ecosystem as we deploy, deploy more. Um, so really getting back to the bread and butter and then doing it really well with Azure, securely, quickly, safely, all that jazz. 
We also have VS Code Day. It's happening April 26. It's starting at 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, so that I'm I'm so excited. I'm gonna. I was invited to be there with like my excellent co- uh, co-host um, Elizio Gizardo, and it's gonna be a rad time. We're gonna be talking about accessibility, Dev containers, GitHub integration, and all around becoming a power user in VS Code. Uh, so join us there April 26th. Don't miss that. That's a full day of programming. And we, we've worked really hard on that. Uh, oh, so if you want to win more prizes, you can uh, join us for Pi Games. So the competition has already started. There's uh, up to like $13,000 uh, worth of prizes uh, that you can win. Uh, we have about... 1200 participants so far but it's beginner friendly so if you want to throw your hat in the ring um you there are the specifications are on the um are on the um, the landing page of the pie games um and then we like judge the competition and then we hand up really goodies so join pie day don't forget to click that link it is aka.ms forward slash pie games plural uh Azure App Service. So this one's been a repeat. We've uh, Azure App Service supports Python 3.11. It's a great segue into the pa- faster P- C Python conversation. So Microsoft has played a big role in um, making Python, this most recent release of Python, faster. It came out in October. Uh, we have a great blog post on that. You should go to Python Devlogs if you just Bing it. You can find Python dev blogs and you can find our blog. We'll also uh, put the link um, in the chat and we can you can go to that, too. Uh, But learn more about um, our contribution to making Python faster. Um, And also, don't as always, don't forget to check out AZD templates. It's a really great way to uh, get your code up into the cloud faster. We also use AZD templates with um, ACA. Yeah, we have some links coming up, too. I'm just zooming through. I really want to get to the meat of it. But here are the links, and it's all in the show notes if you want to catch up. And I went through it too fast. (laughs) Okay, so without further ado, I introduce my uh, inside. Ah, my coworker Luciana. How are you? Hello, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me here today. How are you doing, Don? I'm great. I worked out. My leg hurt, but it's fine. Other than that, I'm great. This is making it better. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about how folks can get the most out of Python with VS Code and Azure. Like you mentioned, this is like our pre-PyCon uh, episode. So if folks are planning to go to PyCon. Uh, we, a lot of what we are going to show today, we're going to have it there and we're going to be talking about it. Uh, we'll have like some really good workshops. Uh, our uh, our colleague and also friend, uh, Savannah Ostrowski, will be there giving out the talk uh, workshop around AZD. So there's a lot of good opportunities there. So yeah, I'm just awesome. excited to dive in. When are, where are you calling in from? I know, but oh, for the audience. That's a good point. So I'm calling from Vancouver, BC, in Canada. I'm originally from Brazil. But I live here in Vancouver working for Yay. Microsoft. You can mention I am the product manager uh, for mm-hmm. Python and VS Code. So that includes like the Python extension, uh, PyLens, the debugger, and things like that. So nice, yeah. right. And you have a ton on your plate. It is really fun to be able to get a peek into the, all the stuff you work on when I get to see you every week. So really glad to have you on the stream and we get to talk about some of those things. I am usually calling in from Philadelphia, but I'm calling in from DC today because I'm just in a different background, different background today. Um, and then we have some a lot of people just like sounding off in the comments. So uh, hello, Philly Pug. What's up? Uh, hi, Claire. And you too. So turn on, oh, note, turn on your YouTube notifications if you want to join us for future weeks. Uh, Come from Pi Liverpool, hello, 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 hello. Brazil, hello, hello. Greece, (laughs) hello, hello. Spain, Venezuela, lots of stuff. International audience, I'm so excited. Um, Yeah, let's dive in. Awesome, let's do it. So I am sharing my screen here uh, so we can take a look. What Mm -hmm. I'm going to be showing today is a Flask application. uh, And I'm going to just show like how we can develop that using the Python extension VS Code, a lot of uh, some other extensions I'm going to showcase too. And then afterwards, how we can quickly deploy that to Azure. Cool. So getting started here, I hope I am sharing my screen. Okay, there we go. Awesome, thank you. 
Uh, so like I said, I have a simple Flask application here. It has like a couple of routes. I have some tasks. I have some templates and all of that. Uh, when we come to our first Python file here, we're going to start seeing like a warning saying that Flask pylons, the, the default language server for Python in VS Code does not uh, recognize what Flask is. And the reason for that is that this is just a recently I uh, cloned repo. I haven't set up anything. I okay. just really clone it and that's it. So, so I need to see how my issue. flask looks when I first start because I'm I'm a Django knot. I'm not a flask person. Oh. I'm getting there. So we're we're giving me a primer because I'm I'm learning my flask. I'd like to be an expert soon. So okay. Perfect. Uh but yeah, so I have a requirements file here. So I'm gonna start from there. Okay. Um, you can see that I have listed my two of my main dependencies, Flask and PyTest. This is not okay. best practices for how to list things and requirements, but we can fix that later. Uh, but basically have these two packages. You can see that the Python extension, the latest version, will show this create environment button to make it easier to create a virtual environment and install these dependencies here. Okay. So clicking that button, I can choose whether I'm going to do a VM or Conda. I'm going to choose VM. Okay. Um, and I'm going to put 3.9 because this is an old application. Don't mind me, but um, you can select 3.11 as everyone should. Uh, and then we're just going to go ahead and install my requirements. Uh, as long as you're not on 2.7. <laughs> I exactly, think that's something we wouldn't want right? to we wouldn't want to advertise. <laughs> that's a good point. Also, the Python extension has really limited support for 2.7, so we really don't want to be using that. Oh, uh, but uh, on purpose. That's good. Let's yeah. let's not do that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but anyway, so you can see the logs as it's going through. So what it's going to do is Chris is going to install my dependencies. It's going to upgrade pip on uh, applications uh, with your virtual environment. We support like we detect requirements dash dev uh, and a lot of variations of requirements. If it's under the folder, we also have a support around installing your dependencies on your behalf. Uh, and you can see here it's right now upgrading pip once it finishes it will select that interpreter for me uh the one that is newly created under this environment and we can go ahead and start uh coding on it right. speaking a bit to install the packages but this is kind of like how you would set it up locally but you can always set it up with containers as well i'm gonna go through that but first of all let me just make sure this application was successfully set up right i'm going to you gave run this application links. there oh sorry Oh no no! You just gave some great Sorry, links, so I'm gonna put them in the chat as you're as you're talking about them too. Oh. They're also in the in the show notes, but like let's let's get the the link for the repo in the in the chat and a couple others. Uh, but keep going. Perfect. Don't worry. Don't worry. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. So uh, there are a couple of ways that I can run my application. This is a Flask app. I kind of set it set set up so I can just run it with like our run file here. If you have like a Flask app that has like a, it's in a subfolder or has like more arguments and things like that, uh, one thing that you can do is to either use our automatic debug configurations. So the Python extension tries to be smart with like what kind of application you have. Uh, so it, it will like auto generate a few configurations for you once you click on this link uh, under the run the debug view. So if I do Python Flask, it will run that. But again, I could have just used this run button for my application. It would have worked the same way. Uh, so once you do that, it will start uh, the debugger. Uh, so for example, I can add like a breakpoint here. And once my uh, application is running, I can just access it and then it will stop in that breakpoint. So okay. here, I'm going to cultural click here. And it's already, so my page is loading because it's it hit the breakpoint. Um, if I step into, uh, we actually can go through ATM, our HTML file. I don't have like a Jinja template or anything defined here that is very interesting, but if I did, I could inspect it, which is pretty cool. Uh, okay. And then once I continue, I can go back to my app. And this is what my app does. It's just a really simple Voila! application. It's so cute. <laughs> it's, called, it's called the cat sign. No, nope. You're not going to press that button. You're not going to turn that on. Is, is Great, that cool. the, the color of, is that the color calico of your, your cats? One of your, any of your cats? Oh, it's not. My cats are like tuxedo cats. So they're like black and white. But we should do, we should add a feature. We should do a PR and update it to a tuxedo cat. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I would like the mittens. That'd be super cute. That's that's gonna be on the backlog there for sure. Uh, but cool. So it's running great. Our app was set up. I 
like I mentioned, we could just set up a dev container. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that Pamela Fox had an episode with you, like the first Python Pulse, right? So I definitely recommend folks to check it out because I think there's a really great deep dive on how that works. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to do something very simple here because... It's Can you give a uh, like a just a one liner on maybe what dev containers um, are for for people who may not be familiar? The way that I like to frame it, it's like it really helps you avoid saying it works on my machine because <laughs> basically it helps you like containerize the application and then allows uh, a reproducible environment. Mm -hmm. And not only that, like a reproducible dev environment. So uh, what we're going to do here, we're going to set up. Um, a dev container, and then we're going to spin it, spin VS Code up inside the container, so that like there's like a VS Code server uh, that is running inside that container. So all my patent interpreter that I'm using, the debugger, everything is running inside the container uh, while the UI like it feels like a local experience because the UI is running locally, but it really gives you that immersive experience inside a container, and then uh, it really allows for reproducible environments, uh, which is what we want, especially for uh, once you're like ready to. Uh, put your code up to production. This is really, really, um, it really makes the process much easier. So I, I'm gonna be very upfront. I'm not super familiar with Docker and how that works. I'm not like very advanced, but what I like about this extension is that it abstracts away a lot of the technicalities around it. It makes it easier for me to configure a dev container for my project. Uh, so I'm going to open the command palette here. A uh, reminder, it's Control shift p if you're on Mac, it's Command-Shift-P. And I'm going to add container, add dev container configuration files. I'm going to run this command. Uh, and then it's, the dev containers extension will just show like a list of a lot of uh, configurations that uh, we have. And you can select, for example, Postgres if you're doing like something with database. You can use Anaconda. Mm -hmm. uh, mine is a simple one, so I'm going to just get three. Uh, Python 3, uh, I'm okay. going to put 3.8. There are a lot of features you can install as well. So for example, if we're doing Thanks, Azure right. development, yeah, we can include that, install. Um, I'm going to skip that part because uh, I know that it also slows it down a little bit, the process of creating the container. Mm -hmm. uh, but all I did was create this dev container folder with my dev container JSON file and with the link to my image mm -hmm. uh, with a Python 3.9 image. Nice. And then... Um, I'm going to go ahead and just uncomment this one here. Here, remove colons. And this is so that my requirements are installed once my uh, container is created. Great, uh, great. Yeah, and I think that's all I need. So VS Code showed, oops, it did not. OK, I thought it did show like a, uh, a notification saying, hey, you have a dev container folder. Do you want to open it inside a container? If, like, I thought it showed disappeared it's fine i have a command for that so okay. we can say uh reopen folder i think reopen folder oh okay folder and container open that folder command palette is so handy it is it really is so i'm gonna open this one mm -hmm. cool i really I like command palette is my go-to feature every single time because i'm like yep yeah, that's all, the hub for all of my commands. Uh, it's but anyway. all in one place. It's great. <laughs> exactly. If like I want to use that feature, I don't remember. Open a command file out, search for something. Um, and then, um, cool. So I'm just seeing the logs to make sure that once everything's done, I know that it's done. But what again? What it's doing is spinning up my container, a uh, bit on the image, and then like uh, setting up VS Code, uh, the VS Code server, and solid extensions, and all of that. So can, I can have like a smooth um, development experience inside a container. Uh, the biggest, okay. uh, I guess, signal that this is working and uh, it's this like dev container button on the bottom left. Yep, uh, yep. And then if you click here, you can see, you can just close things and do all of your remote development uh, actions from this button, which is cool. Great. Uh, cool, awesome. The Python extension is activated. Uh, I can just go ahead and see if it works. So again, like I mentioned, I could just run my app from like this run button. So it should work. Okay, right. Yep, yep, yep. It worked. Great. I can Yay. open in a browser. I can't preview in the editor. I feel like my page is just not very well set up dimensional wise for this. But anyway, it's cool. I can just test it. Cool. It's working. There you go. Yay. Amazing. Yay. Um, <laughs> now, for development, I want, another thing that I like to do is to install some Python tools that will help with making sure my code 
as following standards, as being like properly formatted, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what, what I like to do next is to install a linter or a formatter or both. So okay. um, for the Python for the Python extension, we kind of suggest folks to install a linter extension because that's like provides like a very smooth experience. Um, we have a few extensions for linters like the PyLint extension. We have Flake. Um, and these extensions, basically, they come with the tool installed. So I don't have mm -hmm. to install the tool on my environment in order for this to work. Of course, you can. And there are settings that will, you, you can change so that it uses a specific version or a specific uh, pilot instance that you have. Uh, but if you just want to be using the latest linter, the, the latest version of your linter for all of your projects, then you don't have to keep installing every environment. You just can right. install the extensions. Um, so like I mentioned, we have Pylon, we have Flaky, uh, but what is really cool about this is that there are a lot of now community-based linters that you can use too. So one example is the Rough extension, which is one of my favorites. Uh, it's not Microsoft, uh, it's created by the community, but it's really cool and with support for the Rough linter. And this linter was created with one of our templates. So let me pick, show this here. All of these linters extensions and the formatter ones that I'm going to show too, they're all created based on this template that our team created to make it easier to create uh, Python tools extensions for VS Code. So extensions VS Code, they're written in TypeScript. And we are a Python extension. We provide experience for Python users. And a lot of our Python users always come and tell us, like, I would love to contribute, but I don't do TypeScript. I do Python. Yeah. So what these templates allow you to do is, if you can see, like, a majority of it is actually Python, is to be able to uh, make the changes mostly on the Python files. Because, of course, we have to have the TypeScript ones, because this is a VS Code extension. It is written in TypeScript. But it abstracts away a lot of uh, that functionality so that you don't have to deal with the TypeScript code. Right. Uh, so if you, for example, have a linter that you'd really love to see support for, uh, but it's not officially supported by Microsoft, you can create your own extension with this. Um, I think the main code, everywhere throughout the code, we have like to do's uh, listed. So saying exactly what are the things that you need to edit in order to enable this. Uh, and yeah, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to, for folks to create a linter or formatter for their favorite form, uh, tool in Python nice. with these templates. And yeah, so I think that's super exciting. And uh, that's why uh, rough extension, how that also came to exist. And so yeah, installing it. And you can yeah. see here that it's already showing me some errors saying, hey, this line is too long, uh, but you completely agree. So I want to fix that. I could just hit enter. But why would I do that manually when I can do something automatically? So I'm going to install a formatter. Uh, and formatter, same thing. We have a lot of we have AutoPad Eight extension. Uh, we have the Black formatter, which is uh -huh. my personal favorite. Yeah, okay. Yep, so I'm yep. gonna go ahead and install it. And similarly, like I mentioned, you don't have to have Black installed in your environment once you install it. It's already going to work for you. Um, and, and Pamela you, mentioned something great in the chat. I find that linters are a great way to ensure c consistent code quality and have more productive code reviews in, in, in an organization. Agreed. 100%. Exactly. And what is cool is that you can, uh, with these extensions, you can ensure that your entire team is using the same tool. Uh, and you can ensure consistency across your team as well, right? So that's also pretty cool. Uh, another thing is that sometimes folks are like, oh, but like, I, don't, I use a linter for one project. I don't want to use it for all of my, like, how, what do I do? Uh, one thing you can do is to, you can disable extensions uh, per workspace. So okay, I am right. inside. Yeah. So here I could just disable for a specific workspace. I can disable for everyone. But then that's kind of how you enable disable your formatters and linters. I like to say this, but there is, I, I, VS Code is really flexible and it supports like, I don't know, a dozen ways to do almost any one thing. Um, so sometimes I'll use the settings.json, but sometimes I'll use the UI. And I, I can appreciate how you're, you're clicking around for us and showing us where each of these buttons are. And I just want to kind of bring a note to the audience. Like you had that one button up in the top right hand corner. That's really great. We're also seeing this activity bar on the left, you're going to the extensions button on the left side. Um, and we're getting a lot of really cool things from the the UI and this and well, the command palette that we all were like singing praises on in the very beginning. So I think we're doing really, really great kind of showing off some of the cool UI features of VS Code 2 in this demo. 
That's a good point. VS Code is very customizable. At the same time, it gets like a little bit overwhelming, right? Like, oh my God, what, <laughs> what is it that I have to do? So there's something, a lot of things that we can improve, especially on the Python extension side to improve the experience. So another thing that I would love for folks to do is to give us feedback on what is like the major pain point that we have, what is like very confusing, what could be improved because we are all about trying to make our tools better, right? Yeah. So we also, we recognize it's not the simplest thing in the world. <laughs> Uh, and we're always trying to do better. So we would love to hear all of your thoughts as well on this. And that permeates our team meetings too. Absolutely. And I always, when I first joined the team, for those who may not know, I'm, I'm relatively new to Microsoft and it's really cool how it's underscored. Like if I need to file an issue, it's really in the same place as where the community files issues as well. Um, and so I really appreciate how it's built out in the open. It makes it such a cool pro um, product to be able to represent. So it's really cool. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, cool. So I install my formatter. I'm going to go ahead and right click on the editor uh, to format my document. Again, command palette. I could have done the same thing from the command palette, but I just okay. right clicked. Uh, and I'm going to say format. Uh, the first time you do this with your extension is going to say, oh, you need to select the formatter because the Python extension right now still has some built-in features for formatting. Uh, but we can just go ahead and click on black and I it's going to format my code and that selection you will only have to do that once for a workspace mm -hmm. um so cool my code's formatter and it's great uh so i think now i can go ahead and start adding more things to my application uh one thing i'm going to do is to add a 404 page so if we just enter a route that doesn't exist i want to be able to handle that so i'm going to go ahead and uh do that so if i do dot i uh, Pylons will show me the list of auto completions. Uh, I'm going to use the error handler from Flask. Mm -hmm. uh, and once I open my parentheses, I'm going to see the documentation, which is very helpful. So I can still see what exactly what I need to give. It mm -hmm. also gives me like a example here. So let me nice. just copy it. Um, oh, I have to indent it. Cool. So I have a 404 page. Cool. Let's run it. Um, Oh, my app's still running. Cool, cool, cool. So I guess I can just go back to it. Uh, and nope, it's not running. Let me stop everything and run it again. Cool. Oh, let's preview the editor. I think that's better than just going to the browser again. And we are still oh. in the dev container. So just to kind of underscore yeah. that, like it's exposing the ports for you. It really is seamless. You don't have to do any extra features to like expose those ports. That's true. Like it handles that automatically. So now if I click something, it's going to return this page doesn't exist. Great. Nice. That worked. I do want to do something cuter than this. So instead of just sending the text, I'm going to go and do, I'm going to render a template. I'm going to call this my 404 HTML file. It okay. doesn't exist currently. So I'm going to create it. And then here, I could just use ChatGPT to create an HTML file, but I can also do something sim simpler, which is use um, our template, our snippets. So I have a snippet that I set up that basically does like a 404 HTML file with like some CSS configuration. Okay. Uh, but what I like about snippets is that they are really, well, first they're very configurable, like everything in VS Code. Uh, so oh, I've run too fast. So I open the command palette. I Render configure user snippets command. And then here, um, you can create snippets for specific languages, and this will be specific for the files that you're dealing with. You can also create snippets for a whole project, and this way it's not file dependent, it's really for your entire project that we're working with. I have snippets defined for languages. So if I open the HTML JSON snippet file, uh, let me close the browser. Uh, you can see here that this is the snippet that I'm using for my 404. I defined mm -hmm. it so that I can use for my uh, applications and add 404 HTML pages for them with the cool. same format. Cool. Uh, but I also have a lot of Python ones. And I find these ones helpful because it just like oh, creates wow. the block for us. Yeah. And they're yeah, that's like, great. You can customize your own. If you're like, I don't want to be customizing my own. It feels like a lot of a manual process. Uh, there are a lot of Python snippets out there in the marketplace. So going back here to the extensions marketplace and the activity bar, also one call out culture shift X or command shift X on uh, your keyboard will bring up this extensions view. So if you're using just a keyboard, you can do that. Cool. Uh, and if you search for Python snippets, 
you will see a lot of the options there are really there are ones that are really high rated um and you have Django snippets since you are a Django person Don <laughs> thank you for calling that out that's very kind of you I need to have my snippet game I thought I was doing good but like I need to we need to have a little one-on-one -on -one, like huddle and I need to look at your snippets and see if I can borrow some stuff I will say that we're creating like a Python default Python uh, profile in VS Code, and we can talk about profiles later. But sure. we are going to add a bunch of these snippets there. So stay tuned if you want to have a little bit more of those. We have that on the plan to add them as well. But cool. So I have my 404 page. I added that HTML file. Uh, it reloaded my app. So let me try to run it again. It did not reload my app. Okay, I guess it didn't finish reloading. So we will go and start again, which is fine. Not a big deal. Cool. And now if I do something that doesn't exist, I always do go with blah. I don't know why. But, uh, cool. That looks a little bit better. And I can go back to home to something that works. Cool. Awesome. So we added our 404 page. One thing that we haven't done is add tests for it, because every time we add new code, we add tests, right? Or at least we have we a really good question in the chat, actually. So oh, awesome. Nafil Islam, uh, Islam said, uh, is there anything like a bundle plugin installer, something that just installs everything you might want to do, say Python web development? We are on the same wavelength. I'll let you answer that question, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what I was talking about profiles uh, is kind of like what we are hoping to do. Uh, to solve this problem. So let me just quickly show. So profiles, if you go here on the bottom left corner of your VS Code, there's this gear icon. We have like this profiles option under the menu there. Uh, and the idea is that somewhere here, somewhere here, we would provide Python profiles for folks. So we say we would have like a Python uh, Django one or Python Flask one. And then these profiles, they would, they contain um, a lot of extensions, uh, configurations, so kind of like snippets, uh, settings, and a lot of these things, they're kind of like what we believe to be the best experience for our certain uh, scenarios, in this case, like web development. Uh, and then this is how we're hoping to just address the pain point of every single time you have to configure VS Code, every new machine you have, kind of like having to reconfigure things. There is setting sync that kind of allows you to have, use the same settings for all across uh, your VS Code instances, but profiles can be really specific to a uh, user case, right? Or your type of um, a type of application you, you're constantly doing, like a web application, right? So this is definitely something we are is on a radar and we're hoping to deliver. Soon. -ish. Very soon. And just to kind of because that wouldn't be the first way that I would have answered that question, but I think your your answer is absolutely the best. I, I love profiles because I can create them myself. We are planning on creating them to like help you so we can do that bundle kind of installer thing. And so it includes not just extensions, but also the UI you're using and um, kind of like a lot of other settings that are all around VS Code. But then there's also kind of bundled extensions that exist as well. Um, and so that's a cool that's a cool one. And it's a little bit of a different way to answer the question, but it's bundle inside of a bundle inside of a bundle. Yeah. But yes, we, we're trying to make things easier for you all. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, I guess it could be interpreted in different ways. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. Cool. Cool. So back to adding your test. So we created uh, our page not found. Let's create a test for it here. So I have a, a app with um, an app test file that tests my home route. So I'm going to go and start, and whenever I start like this, I know I'm doing something that probably can be improved, uh, copy and pasting code. So I copied my, um, f I copied my function. I'm going to do a uh, test uh, page not found, create my client. Now I'm going to put something that doesn't exist, doesn't exist. Uh, and then I just want to assert that whatever this response returns, um, so status code uh, is 404. Cool. So I added a test for my page not found uh, method. I'm just going to go here to our testing icon on the activity bar. So on the left, uh, every time you install the Python extension, we're going to display this testing uh, 
B Beaker. Yeah, that's Beaker. Yeah, that's a Beaker, right? Activity bar, and you can click there and configure your tests. So okay. I'm using I installed PyTest in my environment. If you remember from the beginning, that was listed in our requirements TXT. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to be using PyTest. So I'm going to select that for my first question. The next question is going to ask me is select the, to select the directory containing my tests. Uh, my test is actually on the root directory. So I'm just going to select that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it, or it should be it. It's thinking. Let's try again. OK, there we go. It's just a little bit slow. But it's discovering my tests, and it's going to display them here on my page. Kind of had run this before, so let me clear the results. Let's pretend nothing happened, and this is the first time we're running these tests. Uh, so cool, I have my two tests that were discovered. I can run them by hovering over the items on the Test Explorer. Mm -hmm. We also have these icons on the, um, kind of like on the, uh, I forgot the name of this, but right, at, right next to the, the left side of the functions. The well, I think? No, I don't even... Well, not we're not gonna guess. <laughs> There's a exactly, name. Yes, exactly. right on the side, and you're you're clicking it. <laughs> exactly. So I can do that. I can go ahead and run my individual tasks. I can run into all the tasks in my file. Mm -hmm. I, cool. My tests are working. Gutter. Uh, gutter. Thank you. That's it. That's the. Gutter. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, awesome. So, and as I mentioned, when I was copying and pasting, I knew I was doing something that is not ideal. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that I do have another route defined, and I'm never testing it. So let's make sure I include all of this in a nicer way. So I'm going to do that by using PyTest parameterized um, parameterized methods. I don't know. I'm going to use parameterized tests. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a really cool feature from PyTest that really allows you to pass like a, a set of input text and the expected output. And then you can just go ahead and write one function to test all of the variations that you want to test. So I'm going to start by importing PyTest, and then I'm going to do pytest.mark.parameterize. And then here, uh, PyLens will, will tell me like what I should give. So first, I should start giving either a string or a sequence of strings for my arguments. And these are the things that um, are going to be assigned with the parameters that I'm going to add. So I'm going to go and add like an input, because that's going to be like the route that we're going to test. Mm -hmm. and kind of like the response code, the expected response code. Cool. And then uh, I can go ahead and see that I need to pass the argument value. So what these parameters will end up assigning every iteration where my test is running. Okay. Um, it's a sequence of objects. In this case, I'm giving passing two um, items there. So I'm going to give a list of tuples. Um, and I'm going to start with my input. So for example, I know that if I do slash, I need to get a response code that is 200. It needs to direct me to my main page. Yep, that makes sense. Absolutely. And then if I do something that doesn't exist, again, my favorite blah, <laughs> I need to return a 404 code. And my other route, it was fav icon. Was that it? Fave icon, the icon. Let's just paste it to make sure mm -hmm. I'm doing the right thing. Oops. Uh oh, there we go. Uh, and this one needs to be 200 as well. Cool. And oh, the warning here is that this line is too long. So I'm going to go ahead and format it. Again, we can, oh, not again. I haven't said that before. You can customize VS Code to format on save. So this is something that we can edit if we want to. Um, but cool. I will now, now I need to update the function to accept our input and our response code. So I'm going to put my input here and my response code. And I think I went too fast, but Pylons, I, we, this is something that is kind of newish. I think it's from two or three months ago. We added support so that you can basically see the parameters that you added to your parameterized decorator, and then you're able to more easily autocomplete when you're filling up your function, which can be super helpful. It also does um, a little bit of the type um, inspection. So it nice. will tell you like what is the types of your parameters. Based, in this case, it's like the literals that I'm passing, but it's pretty cool. Awesome. Uh, cool. Now I need to actually change this to get the input. Um, I'm not going to print anything anymore. And sure, I'm going to assert error is not there, but I'm also going to assert that 
uh, the response that I got, the status code of that is whatever the response code that I'm expecting it to be. Okay. Yep. And now I can remove this one and hopefully that should work. So let's rediscover our tests, uh, clear the results because they are stale. Um, yeah. And you can see that here we now have a line for each parameterized um, pair mm -hmm. uh, from input and uh, output. So I can run specific ones or I can mm -hmm. run all of them, which is pretty cool. What's yep. also very cool is that with the debugger, we can actually inspect it going every single parameter. So I'm going to add like a breakpoint here on this last line, uh, and I'm going to debug all of my tests in sequence. Mm -hmm. And then once we start the debugger, it will show my variables and everything. And I can see, so you can see that here, I already have a response code, I already have an input. And I yes. added this breakpoint at this line on purpose because, you know, I, sometimes I do that. Actually, I put a breakpoint and I'm like, oh no, I wish I had put it before. And I wanted to highlight this feature that I don't know, I don't think a lot of people know, okay. which is jump to cursor. So if you uh, right click, right click, yeah, it's right. Right <laughs> uh, if you right click on the line that you want to um, kind of like re-execute, uh, you can go here on the jump to cursor. It's one of the options that we have in the context menu. And then it will set the next statement to be that line. So it's I not didn't know that one. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> So, yay! Okay, cool. Yeah, I I don't know. I just get this. I'm genuinely get excited with these little features. These are cool. Anyway, but let's... honestly, I felt the same when I discovered because this has been there forever. But I only found out like way after it was um set. So in Visual Studio, that's what the equivalent of set next statement. If you're used to Visual Studio, that's the same thing. A lot of people are like, oh, is it like time traveling? Like it's not time travel debugging. It doesn't go back on anything. It really just set the next statement. So it has to be in that context of the file. So I can't just set next statement for or jump to cursor everywhere else. Everywhere else. It has to be in the context. But in this okay. case, you're super helpful because I can go ahead and just like, no, no, re-execute this, recreate the client. And then I can go ahead and see like, okay, what is the response and how is it changing? Yeah. I can set up like watch uh statements and all of that so that's pretty cool and we when i'm in the middle going. of debugging i'm always like key smash key smash key smash so this will help at least exactly. mitigate some of the key smashing yes okay <laughs> yeah exactly so it's super cool uh and you can see the inputs are varying and all of that so that's great uh the one thing i'll say is that i have been c creating this test client every single time mm -hmm. which isn't uh the ideal so one thing that I can do is to create a pass test, a PyTest fixture so that the, this uh, test client method is called before my tests are run. And this way I'm just setting up uh, all of my tests with the same client. Nice. Uh, yep. So I'm going to go and click on this light bulb that shows up when I select this line of code. And I'm going to use one of the refactoring uh, functions from PyLens, which is extract a method. Okay. And I'm going to call this uh, create client. And I'm going to make this a PyTest fixture. So I'm going to annotate it with pytest.fixture. Uh, I will pass a scope to it so that it's only executed once per session. Because uh, I don't need to recreate a client every single time. I can just do that for one test session. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Uh, the other thing that I did, um, so I just create this and I'm returning the test client which is not the best because um, we want to make sure that Flask is able to handle the termination of test client and okay. that the fixture is able to perform whatever functions it wants to after the, this, the um, fixture is created. So one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use with uh, app test client as client. And then instead of returning my client, I'm going to yield it. And this is so that whenever this is called again, all the rest of my methods can be executed normally uh, and okay. just really avoid any bugs in the future, right? Right. Um, so now what I need to do is instead of calling it, I need to pass my fixture. So I'm going to just pass it mm -hmm. here. Uh, and if you hover over it, you can see that PyLens knows that this is a function. Um, yeah. And that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And now instead of test client, I'm actually calling create client. And that's it. Cool. So we just rerun, make sure it's 
working again, clear my results. And let's see if it's working. Yay, it's working, great. So that's awesome, we have our tests. Uh, one thing that I will call out that I think it's super cool with our PyTest features as well, and something that we added recently, are inlaying hints. And inlaying hints are not mm -hmm. just for PyTest, so I'm gonna show it generally as well. Uh, so I'm gonna open our settings uh, in VS Code. You can do file, preferences, settings, or you can do culture shift P, command palette, settings, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'm going to look for inlay hints. I'm going to get the pylons inlay hints. So you can see yep. there are three settings that we offer. So we you can enable or disable inlay hints for function return times, PyTest parameters, variable types. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to enable all of them so you all can see how that works. So here okay. on my app file, we're going to see... Oh, there we go. Uh, you can see that it will infer the types, the return types for my functions, uh, as well as I don't have any parameters here or variables here, so that's fine. But on my other one here, I should have some variables and it will kick in just a second and we'll be able to see the inferred uh, types for that. And Yay, so type hints for a dynamically typed language. Woo! Exactly. Like I, just, I think we should pause for that. Like type uh, type hinting is, is really big in the community right now. Like we're really doing this push and there's a, a large conversation on whether or not people are putting type hints into their code. So I'm really glad that we are able to cover this feature today. That's so awesome. Yay, right exactly. on time. And if you want to, you can double click to accept it. Um, we also do that for PyTest parameter types. So here we're inferring what are the parameters with the literals. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can go ahead and double click it to accept it if you want to annotate your code, which is pretty cool. So right. just wanted to call out this feature because it's really good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I feel like our app's doing well. It's doing great. I would love to just go ahead and deploy it to Azure. Okay, um, we're doing a deploy today. Yes, exactly. okay. This is exciting. <laughs> uh, so the way that... Again, like I mentioned, I just like with containers, mm -hmm. I'm not super an expert on the cloud. I actually find it quite overwhelming because I never know exactly which servers I want to, what is the right configuration, what are the right resources. So yeah. what I really appreciate about uh, AZD, like you mentioned before, even on the announcements, uh, which is also called uh, the Azure Developer CLI. Uh, we also have an extension for it in VS Code, but it's like a CLI tool. Mm -hmm. um, is that it really helps uh, abstract away a lot of the knowledge that you, you would have to have in order to create the resources manually or even create a script that would do that on your behalf. Right. Uh, because it offers templates that you can just use uh, and and then like more quickly set up your application to uh, go to Azure because it handles all the provisioning on your behalf. So I'm gonna, I haven't set up this container to use it. So that's why I'm gonna reopen this folder locally but if you, um, even when you're adding, like creating the, um, the template for your AD um, project, it will create mm -hmm. like a dev container for you with the install purposes of this demo and I'm not doing it. Uh, but with that, I will go ahead and uh, I, I could use the extension commands and VS Code under Azure. So everything I'm doing in the terminal, you can buy if you like. Oh, let's just pause for a moment. I think we might have some connection issues, but I do uh, want to highlight. Uh, I'm going to do it from like commands. Cool. Good. One, one moment. I just, could you repeat the last well. part? Could you repeat the last part for again? Because I think we might have some connection issues. Oh, sure, for sure. Uh, I think I was saying that everything we can do with AZD in the terminal, we can do with the extension itself. So I could just open a command yeah. palette and run the commands. Uh, but I'm going to use the terminal because that's how I prefer. Was that? Yeah, that cool, was cool, cool. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. it. Perfect. Cool. So the first thing for to use AZD is to log in your account. You will need a subscription. So uh, you, you do have free credits with Azure once you get started. So you can follow along and create like an Azure mm -hmm. account and use free credits for that. Uh, but what we are doing here does it, uh, will lead to credits being used. Uh, so this is a disclaimer. But yeah. um, I I have a subscription. 
on Azure already, so I'm not going to go through the steps of setting that up. But once you log in with AZD, uh, one thing that I was saying, that one thing that you can do to set up your app to deploy on Azure is use the init command. Mm -hmm. So like I mentioned, AZD relies, uh, basically the whole premise is that it has like a list of templates. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can create templates for it that can be used to uh, provision your application on Azure and all of those things. So uh, you can actually pass like a template flag. So azd init dash dash template, mm -hmm. and then give like the, a repo with the, your azd template. Mm -hmm. uh, azd has, like you mentioned in the beginning, right? Like the azd templates. Uh, this website here has a lot of existing templates uh, already provided by the team, by the community. So mm -hmm. if you want the Python ones, you can see all the ones that it has. Uh, and if you are, you can also create and contribute to templates. So if you have one that you want your entire team to use or teams across your company to use, you can create one and this will be available because these templates are open source, which is pretty, cool. pretty cool. I'll put the link in the chat too. Perfect, There's a thank you. Templates too. Um, and I'm going to just run in it. I'm not going to pass a template because it has like a, a few of like the boilerplate um, templates that I can use. So I'm going to use this Python Mongo one, but you can use for Azure Container Apps functions okay. uh, and all of that. So I'm going to create this one. Uh, it's going to ask me if I want to override my existing files that are also provided by the, uh, the template. I'm going to let it override because I want to have the new dev container uh, folder that it creates. And what is, oh, it's going to ask me for an environment name. This is really to represent my application. It's not like a virtual environment. It's just like a environment for Azure. Uh, I'm going to call it the cat said, no, sir. Uh, and then uh, that's it. It will initialize my project. It will create a lot of uh, folders for me. So like I mentioned, the dev container one, it will, uh, set up the dev container JSON kind of like what we did, but with a little bit more configuration also to a Docker file and it will tell, will tell the container to install AZD mm -hmm. there. I am, um, I think like the main files here. So there's the Azure YAML and this is where you tell AZD what kind of application you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, the template that I chose has like a JavaScript, uh, front end and a Python back end. My yeah. app is pretty simple. I only have Python, so I can just delete that. I can name it like the cat said no. I can I could create like a template uh, for it as well. So if I rename it, I could generate a new template. Um, oh, okay, right, right, right. And then uh, the infra, I guess this is the main important thing and the thing that really helps you set up, uh, get your resources provision on Azure. So yep. this main bicep file is where it's really instantiated and in, in, uh, setting up all the resources that you need. So we have a resource group. It will, it has links. It has like a bicep files for every part of my application as well. So this is just in front end. We have one for the back end, and a lot of these like, uh, so if you want to use a database or key vault or all of these things, it does that on for all for your on your behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are like Bicep, but you it also supports Terraform. So we have templates for Terraform too. Um, so it's really up to you. And uh, from here, what you do, you, uh, for example, I'm not going to use a database. So I can just go ahead and start deleting things. Uh, oh, this what is really handy is that I have like these Bicep extension installed. And oh, that yeah. really makes it easier to fix and actually handle all of this because it's going to say, well, you deleted your database. So I don't know what all of these means, right? So I can right. just go ahead and start deleting the things that I am no longer going to need. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can right. do a bunch of cleaning up, a lot of like deleting. So again, uh, not going to use the database. So I can just go ahead and delete it uh, and start like removing the things that I don't need. Mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of time, I will... Uh, go to my branch where I've done this process for already. Uh, let me just add a commit message so it doesn't yell. Uh, I love it. <laughs> we show you how to bake the cake and then we pull out the oven a finished cake. <laughs> That's great. great. Exactly. Yeah, it's the cookie show trick, right? Uh, <laughs> get a commit for me. Let me try to go to AZ Defied. 
stash, sure. Stash, demo, I don't know. Um, can you please just do this for me? Okay, I'll just delete everything. It's a demo. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> and I'll just go to my AZ side, uh, branch where everything is. Uh, again, I have my infra uh, folder. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it's like empty, so I could just go and delete it. But I think like the main ones are the host uh, mm -hmm. and the web bicep. I ended up with like four files only, which is good. Uh, but cool. Nice. So once I finish cleaning this up, I can just go ahead and do AZD up. And AZD up is going to be uh, how you're going to deploy your app uh, for mm -hmm. Azure. So I think I said cat set notes are. It's going to ask like, so what is the subscription we, that we I want to use? We pulled the template. We we pulled the template. We removed some extra cuff that we don't need because it, we have a more simple version than what we had. You could add things if it ends up being more complicated. There are other templates that can help you with that. And then you do AZD up. This is, I mean, boom, boom, boom. This is really good. Yeah. Um, and then it's going to ask which subscription you want to use. I'm going to do that. The location as well. I am. I think the closest here is going to be West US. Okay. And then it's going to start provisioning the resources and it's going to start my application, uh, deploy my app. This part can take a while. Uh, I, I think like when I did this, it took uh, six to seven minutes, uh, okay. which is why I brought already deployed version of it. Uh, let me find a, one of my tabs here. here so I go. already had like a deployed version of it. I, I just followed the same steps that I did here uh, to get my app up and running the, the slowest part of the process is waiting for the resources to provision but then you could just take a break drink some water and all of that right and um, you could do what i do which is just like watch the logs go watch yeah. the log. <laughs> it's kind of like a meditation practice it right? is we were, and we were talking about meditation before this call but anyway that's neither here nor there we've we're actually really good on time you kind of kicked butt on that um but yeah let's yeah i'm so excited yeah, and that's kind of what I had planned to show you all today. Kind of like how you can power up your Python uh, development skills and then all the VS Code extensions and the features that you can use to more productively, you know, uh, work with your Python code and then get it to Azure with like just a few steps. So nice. Like, like I mentioned, we are going to be at PyCon talking about all of the things that I mentioned here today. Oh, uh, we had a slide for that too. So go ahead. Great segue. <laughs> sure. I can. Do you want me to pull up the slide? That would be great. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Easy peasy. Let me. I did not plan for this part, but it's okay. It's right here. It's close. Where did I put that sucker? Um. Do here. I think this is it. Ha ha! We are. It's almost like I planned this. Okay. Um. Let's. Let's actually just. Um. We're all friends here. We'll just take two seconds to do the, because I only have one screen because I'm traveling. Um, all of them are in the notes. I don't know if we, do we want the visual aspect as well? Cause it's fine. I'm taking a second to find it. Should we give up on having? It's just like two slides. Yeah, yeah. We, we had. <laughs> we'll just talk about it. We had such an interactive episode. We'll we'll just talk about it. Um, but we, I did want to go through. So we had two slides. It was just a one is a summary of what we went what we went through. So we we talked about setting up your project. Luciana went great into detail on the local development and dev containers. Links are in the uh, stream notes. Um, and Peggy, could you put up on the on the the screen the local development um, link? I don't know if we if I identified which ones were which. Probably. 
perhaps. So we did, yeah. So we have that one. Uh, so that's local development. Then we also have went through dev containers. And that's a different link. And then we had installing linters and formatters. That's another great link. Awesome. And then we had uh, type hinting and IntelliSense. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, then we went through writing tests with PyTest. And then we went through refactoring our code. And then we did deploying your uh, your code with AZD. And blink heavy episode. We really want you to have all of these resources. This was a primer on a lot. Luciana did an amazing job on that. And then we we had a list of things, and it's also in the in the show notes of things that we're going to be covering at PyCon. So. I'll say the things Luciana can give some some jump. Feel free to jump in on some of these descriptions too. But we're going to be covering in at PyCon VS Code profiles, IntelliSense extensions, and other tools to supercharge your development environment. One of which will be Dev Containers. Um, we're going to be testing our application. We'll be bringing in Playwright into the into the picture as well, which is really cool. Um, and we'll have a presentation on that. We also have deploying uh, a, a Django application with Azure Container Apps. And so I mentioned beforehand at the top of the stream, I had a great stream yesterday with uh, Jay Miller on deploying your container apps. And so that's a little bit of a hint onto the lab where you can win cool prizes. You can also win cool prizes um, if you if you join the, the, the Discord. So join the Discord, talk to us, hang out. Uh, we have live podcast recordings. Do you want to talk about that, Luciana? Oh, yeah. It's like we're arranging the details, but we're uh, hoping to record, well, I guess two episodes. Two. Uh, yeah. Surprise, surprise was going to be, but stay tuned. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, then we have some booth presentations that I mentioned before. And then we have special presentations from um, really awesome, laudable people. I mean, that we work with, like they're normal humans that we work with every day, but they they do a lot in the Python community. So we have Inside C Python 311's new specializing adaptive interpreter with Brant Butcher. Uh, uh, we have a per interp interpreter GIL, uh, GIL, which is concern concurrency and parallelism, parallelism with sub interpreters with Eric Snow. I understand that, but he's going to explain it because I the, the 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 name of the presentation really tripped me up anyway. <laughs> We have Brett Cannon's uh, Python Syntactic Sugar, which is really exciting. And we're going to get some like changes from the previous presentation that we did at past Pi Cascades. If you caught that, it was really, really good. And we get a new updated version. So that's really excited, exciting. And then we're also uh, have a talk with Mark Shannon about how we're making CPython faster past, present and future. Tons of stuff for PyCon. And if you're not able to join us in Salt Lake City, it will also, all of these things and resources and links and video links uh, will be available between the PyCon US uh, videos that are posted on YouTube for free after, or you can uh, get some resources in our Discord. Yeah. I mean, this was a really great episode. I'm so, th I'm so thankful that you joined us today. Um, yeah. I'm thankful for you inviting me and for everyone who's watching us and uh, a lot of the some really uh, awesome engagement. So oh I'm my just catching yeah. up on the comments now. So thanks everyone, really appreciate it. And thank you, Don, for being an excellent host here and for having me here as a special guest too. Yay! See you all next month. Thanks. Bye y'all. <laughs>